So those who are watching, thank you so much for joining us at the My OCD Care Lecture Series. Uh, tonight we have a very special guest. Um, Dr. Rebecca Sachs will introduce in a moment. Uh, this lecture, like the previous one, is sponsored by uh, the place where I hold my office, who uh, provided the wine and cheese in the conference room, uh, select office suites in the financial district. Um, so thank you so much. And just a little intro. Oh, our next lecture is uh, December 5th, I believe. I think the 5th. If it's a Thursday, then it's a 5th. Um, yeah, so that's going to be Dr. Avital Falk, who is featured in the New York Times. And she'll be discussing intensive treatment courses with her adolescent and child OCD. Um, tonight, we are privileged to have Dr. Rebecca Sachs, um, PhD, ABPP. Uh, she's a clinical psychologist specializing in the assessment and treatment of individuals on the autism spectrum with obsessive compulsive disorder and severe anxiety. She is board certified in behavioral and cognitive therapy and brings warmth, sensitivity, and a strong sense of humor. I could definitely vouch for that. Uh, to her work as a licensed clinical psychologist, Dr. Sachs maintains a private practice in Manhattan, New York, as well as Park Slope, Brooklyn. And you can learn more about her at cbtspectrum.com, which is the name of her practice. Someone who I'm very proud to call a colleague and a friend. Uh, take it away, Dr. Sachs. All right. Thanks so much. And hearing more about the lineup for these talks, I feel even more honored that you asked me to be part of the group because some really nice speakers. Um, so hello, everybody out there into the internet. And hello, everybody in this room. Um, we're going to do something a little differently than the other talks is that I'm not going to have the slides behind me because they're not cooperating, and that's okay. Yeah. Um, we're going to be super flexible. So Elliot should have posted a link mm -hmm. that you can go to where you can click on that link and download the slides, okay. and you can follow along if you want. Um, yeah, great. He, he just posted them in the chat box. So if for some, I'll wait like a second or two, and if for some reason um, that's not working, I would just put a comment in. And um, the audience here is going to be able to look at the slides, and I'm going to have the slides in front of me. So hopefully we're going to make this work. Um, I'm going to try my hardest, even though I am a very talkative person, to keep our time and really make sure there's time for questions at the end. Um, so going to dive in. So if you go to that first slide where you see this person, they're about to leave their home, and they're looking at this doormat where it says keys, glasses, phone, debit card, and purse, turn off iron and stove. Now, so to all of the psychologists who are typically treating OCD, you are probably thinking to yourself, no, don't have that as your floor mat. Don't have that reassure you or to check or to compulse. And I would agree with you. But if you're a therapist out there who's working with people who are autistic or on the autism spectrum, you go, this is brilliant. This is the best doormat in the world for people of working memories issues and executive functioning and who process information visually. This is phenomenal. They don't have to worry about all these things on their own. So we're going to talk about when is this doormat helpful? When is this doormat hurtful? And what do we do if a person has both? Do we use the doormat or do we have some kind of other alternative? And that's hopefully the question I'm going to answer today is what's our doormat situation depending on who we're seeing and how do we figure that out? So the first thing I want to do is just give a very quick overview on autism and where we're at. So you've probably heard a lot of terms of Asperger's, autism, high-functioning autism, PDD-NOS, which stands for Pervasive Developmental Disorder, not otherwise specified. So what happened is, is when we switched from the Gray Bible to the Purple Bible in North America, we went from DSM-4 to DSM-5, what they decided to do is one of the big categorical shifts is they created one large umbrella group for autism spectrum disorders as opposed to all these separate conditions. 
And one of the main reasons why I think that they decided to do that was because clinicians were not really using these different terms in um, diagnoses reliably. So a person could walk into one office and get a diagnosis of PDD and OS, and they could walk into the second office and get a diagnosis of Asperger's, and they could walk into a third diagnosis and get autism. And so the whole point of labels or diagnoses is to carry along meaningful information. If we were finding they weren't really being used with reliability, they weren't carrying along information. Um, so here's the thing, I say North America. So the international codes ICD still retains Asperger syndrome. So if you got a diagnosis in England or Australia by um, Baron Cohen or by Atwood, um, we'd still potentially be considering a diagnosis of Asperger's. And if you previously was diagnosed with PDD, NOS, or Asperger's, and that label is really meaningful to you, you can hold on to that, which sometimes people who are Aspies um, find that community and that label is really meaningful. So I don't think the jury's out, but I just wanted to note that change. And what I tend to do in terms of language is I sort of explain this to my patients. I also explain to my patients this next slide about this difference between identity first and person first language. So identity first says, I'm an autistic person. That's who I am. Whereas a uh, person first language would say is I'm a person with autism. So there's been a real discourse in the community as to what's the right label. To me is I like to say is for the people in front of me, what label do they prefer? I talk it over with them and if they have a strong opinion, that's what I tend to do. And I just wanted to throw that out there in terms of language. So for people who maybe are wondering Asperger's syndrome, what would be the difference? Let's say there are people out there who are international. Um, so. What we know about Asperger's is that in early childhood, there was not necessarily a speech delay. So people are either meeting their speech milestones or in fact, maybe even early talkers. But what we do know is we really focus on their current language use and really looking at practically or pragmatically, how are they using language to communicate? And what we're still finding is those core deficits that are in line with autism, um, but there were no speech delays. So one in 59 children are currently being diagnosed with autism. And we know that individuals with autism get mental health conditions, not only at the same rate as neurotypical people, but in fact, even more. So what does that mean? So that means if you're a specialist specializing in OCD or anxiety, I can guarantee you that at some point in your career, you're gonna work with a person with autism. Now they may not have been diagnosed or they may have, but knowing sort of these rates, we want to do it. So Valerie Gauss, who wrote the book Living Well on the Spectrum, and who also wrote a phenomenal book, because she just came out with her second edition. She's not paying me to plug the book. I just really like the book. It's um, CBT for adults um, on the autism spectrum. And Val Gauss one time said, is, if you had an autistic person who had strep throat, would you ever think to withhold penicillin, first line treatment, from this individual just because they have autism? And you would say, absolutely not. That sounds bonkers. So we want to make sure we're also thinking that same way when we're talking about treatment of OCD and anxiety, that if we know cognitive behavioral therapy with exposure and response prevention is first line treatment for OCD, just like we wouldn't withhold penicillin, we definitely don't want to withhold CBT with ERP from an autistic person with OCD. And I guarantee you, you're gonna meet somebody at some point in your career, and that's why I think you're here. And so kudos to you that we're learning a little bit more about this. A lot has been said about the gender differentials. What I would say is I actually think probably the male to female ratio of individuals with autism is probably a little bit narrower than what we typically think. What we know is a lot of the measures that are out there were developed and normed for a more male presentation of autism. And as we start using um, alternative measures or asking questions in a slightly different way, we see that the same core deficits of autism are still there. They just look a little different in females. Um, so just something to throw out there in terms of this idea. We also know this cuts across socioeconomics and race um, and affects all people equally. 
So now let's get to what is autism. So two really big things when we're thinking about it. Autism is a developmental delay or a developmental disorder. So what we say is this is a lifelong condition. So while the core deficits are going to look a little different at different stages of life, we do know that these core deficits and challenges are present all throughout the lifespan. And in terms of a differential diagnosis, I think that's just really important. I had a patient once who came to me turned out they had OCD and severe social anxiety, but they almost presented like they had situational autism. They would shut down. It would be really hard for them to communicate. Their body language and their nonverbals would really, really look that way. They'd become very, very, very rigid and stuck. And one of the things that really helped me be able to conceptualize what was really going on was a good developmental history and realizing that all of these symptoms did not appear until puberty, when there were body and brain changes and different demand changes, and that's really when the social anxiety and OCD hit, and that all of these communication difficulties were really not there in early childhood or in primary school. So just something to think about when you're trying to make that differential diagnosis. We also talk about, you may have heard of high-functioning autism. So I really do not like that term because what does high-functioning even mean? Um, it also is everybody's high-functioning or everybody's child is high-functioning, which is like everybody's an above-average driver. It's just not possible. Um, and also, if somebody's in our office, clearly their functioning is impacted in some way. So what I really like to do is how the DSM conceptualizes it and talks about severity level. And what severity level is really based on is this idea of how much support does an individual need in their core deficits. So I keep on saying core deficits, core deficits. What are these core deficits, Rebecca? Well, so the core deficits are deficits in social communication and social interaction. So how are people interacting with each other? How are they using language practically and also even nonverbal language practically to communicate with others and develop relationships? So you can see I'm a New Yorker. I gesture a lot. That's one example of social communication. You guys are all nodding your head even though I can't see you on the webinar and you're smiling at me you're, as I'm telling this. This is how the people in the room are doing it. This is all forms of social communication that's letting me know that I'm witty, I'm great, I'm doing a good job. Um, thank you, by the way. Uh, they all agree. <laughs> so this is what's one of these deficits or that's a challenge or difficult for some people on the spectrum. What we also know the DSM says is restrictive repetitive patterns, and I'm noticing a typo, of uh, behavior and interest. What I really like to think it is, this is rigid thinking and rigid behaving and repetitive behaving. Um, so this is where we typically think about stimming behavior, flapping behavior, scripting, um, perseveration, insistent on sameness and routines, difficulty with changes and transitions, very, very sort of narrowed interests, so definitely not Renaissance women and men, or trying to loop back to their preferred interests, very, very strong difficulty transitioning off of preferred interests. Um, and then what I would also say is DSM-5, when it came out, what it also definitely did a good job of making sure to include in this idea of core deficits was the idea of sensory sensitivities, where people may become overwhelmed by sensory information, or people may actually be underwhelmed and seek out sensory information in different ways. Um, so when we're talking about sort of these core challenges, they're usually going to fall in these two categories um, and look very different. So practically speaking, um, not in the DSM, don't really talk about it, but want to talk about this idea of social camouflage or masking. So especially for our average to above average um, IQ individuals who are also very verbal, who also are socially motivated, because that's been one of the things is they don't want friends. Well, they actually do want friends. It's just actually challenging sometimes for them to make friends they intuitively may do something that we call social camouflaging, trying their hardest and exerting so much energy to mask 
the way that their brain works a little differently and what may come naturally. So eye contact, for example, may feel really, really difficult and hard and just uncomfortable, but working really hard to maintain eye contact, working really, really hard um, to just look normal is usually the word. The reason why I bring it up is sometimes people will come into therapy and won't necessarily appear autistic from first glance at intake, um, but that might not necessarily be the case. What we also know from the research is individuals, especially teens and young adults, who do a lot of social camouflaging and masking actually um, have higher depression and higher suicidality and actually higher suicide rates. So this is actually a really big thing that often for parents, they're saying, well, my kid is doing such a good job. They look normal. Right. And it's actually, mm, well, maybe they're doing a really good job at social camouflaging and we're actually predisposing them to some other mental health conditions. And we want to keep that in mind. I alluded to it before. ASD can look different in females. Also, hyperverbal autistic people. So you, there's usually this idea that talking is difficult or challenging. You may get some people, which for lack of a better term, almost sometimes appears like verbal vomit, or it's really hard to get a word in edgewise with these people. And this is what I call hyperverbal autistic people. Um, and can really talk about a whole lot of different things. Um, yeah, the one other thing that I would say diagnostically that I often find is really, really helpful is looking at social interaction with same age peers. What we know is autistic individuals all across the lifespan often do better with people who are younger than them and people who are older than them. And sometimes, especially when you're working with children and teens and even young adults, like college age adults, some of the adults in their life and even us professionals may miss this because we may be the older people in the room. Like we're connecting in that way with them. And so I would really often encourage asking about same age peer relationships, trying to do as much in vivo observation if we're trying to answer this question. So this next slide over here is literally taken right out of the DSM-5, and I'm not going to go over it in detail. I just really like to highlight that when you're thinking about severity level, moving off of that idea of high functioning versus low functioning, how much support does an individual actually need? Um, and just looking at the DSM-5 in terms of the chart that's there to start to help conceptualize what are the areas of need for an individual and properly diagnosing them. So again, on this next slide, what I really like to talk about is, again, what's not in the DSM. So if you're in the autism community, you know that there's an expression called, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. And so what that really means is while these core deficits may sort of be the same, how they look person to person, and even in the same person, how they look throughout the lifespan can really, really change and there can be some variability. And the way that sort of impacts these different things is let's say IQ. So what we know is that autism affects individuals with IQ all over the bell curve. But for a lot of people who are often work, walking into our office who are average or above average IQ, one of the things that I really like to stress is this idea of IQ is not necessar necessarily a unitary score for these individuals. If I say, what's your IQ? And they would say 110. For most of my autistic patients, it's not 110. Because what we see in their IQ is there's a lot of variability and scatter. And so why that practically makes sense is we're often seeing their verbal abilities are far higher than typically their working memory and processing speed. Now, again, this isn't for every patient of mine, but it's, um, it's a, a pattern that's pretty common. And so the reason why it's clinically relevant, especially when you're also treating a person with OCD, is if we think about working memory and processing speed, it's really going to impact generalization of our exposures and also how quickly we can move through exposures and the pacing of our treatment and also just the pacing of our session in general. So many times I say to a patient is as I think their wheels are turning, are you still thinking? And so sometimes they'll still be thinking, and I'm glad I waited that time. And other times they'll go, I forgot the question. Can you repeat it? And either way, it's fine, but I'm not jumping in and necessarily answering the question for them. If you can also imagine, this must be particularly frustrating. If you had a car with four wheels, and all four wheels are moving at very drastically different speeds, 
the car is going to be off balance. And it's probably very, very frustrating for certain individuals. And what we're also going to see is people are going to over rely on their um, relative strengths, and they're going to sort of ignore their relative weaknesses. And so for therapists here who are working with OCD, who are constantly leaning into discomfort, not avoiding or escaping what comes more challenging for us, this is actually an area we can target. We can sort of rely on our ERP skills to encourage a person not to just focus on their strengths, but, and again, it's more addressing the autism, but you can really capitalize on sort of how you do OCD treatment in this area. Executive functioning, there's a lot of variability. So executive functioning profiles often look different than ADHD profiles. Um, and so what I would say is the three big areas of executive functioning that are impacted for a person with autism are planning, prioritizing, and flexibility and shift. Um, and so we just want to think about how planning and prioritizing may affect our patients, both in session, how they're organizing the information and prioritizing, how they're going to go out and do um, homework in between sessions. Social skills and communication skills, emotional regulation, we're going to see a lot of variability, sensory motor, and definitely adaptive skills. Um, so I'm just checking my time. All right. So far, I think I'm doing okay. I'm going to do my self-talk, and I'm doing a self-talk thumbs up in my head. And that's actually something that I like to point out. I just was talking to a colleague about a case of hers. We're doing self-talk all the time. I'm doing crap tons of self-talk right now as I'm giving this talk to you. Um, sometimes there's superfluous thoughts, and other times I'm keeping myself pretty well regulated on the point. If we think about, again, that autism is a social communication um, challenge to them, that's a core deficit. Well, it's not just social communication with other people. It's also social communication with yourself. That Sometimes that self-talk isn't necessarily happening in the same way. And that's something that we're going to want to work on with an individual with autism is all these like things that we take for granted with self-talk to help regulate our behavior when we're pushing through exposures, regulate our emotions, all these different kinds of things, regulate what we're communicating to other people. Um, we're going to actually want to create an assist or maybe even like teach this skill to people. Um, so I like to think about instead is that autism is an information processing difference. Um, and so what do I mean is they process information differently with um, social information, emotional information, and sensory information, and then um, non-social information. So in terms of non-social information, we know it tends to be very black and white thinkers. Um, can often focus on details, and it's really sometimes hard to see the big picture, the gestalt, or abstraction is often very, very difficult um, for individuals on the spectrum. So sort of this dichotomous, part whole thinking. Um, in terms of social differences, sometimes really hard to pick out or notice what is the most important piece of social, social information make meaning of it, and then how do I act on that? And what I would say is sometimes people are good at that on the spectrum, but how do they do this spontaneously? It might be sort of a processing speed thing that's a little bit challenging. Emotional differences, um, short, quick way, because I know I don't have a lot of time, is sort of two things, is this idea of alexithymia, so hard to put words or have an emotional vocabulary to what their experience is. I just um, met a 50-year-old patient who was recently diagnosed with autism, and um, she was actually, she had done on her own Russ Harris's The Happiness Trap. I think there was like a self-learning course, and part of the handout that Russ had was this like emotions list, and she said, Crap, if I had had this list of emotions my entire life, that would have made life so much easier to express what I was experiencing. So one of the things that we may want to have is if you just even one of the best visuals I like, if you Google emotions wheel, it's beautiful, it's with colors, it sort of organizes it and divides it up. I really like to have that handy. So like if I'm doing a thought record and I get to the point like, what were your emotions? Look at the emotions wheel or like, what are you feeling right now? Um, so just that one thing is really being able to build up that emotional vocabulary um, because it's not so. What I also have noticed is sometimes like feeling emotions is a little different and it may be a much more somatic 
sort of experience. So one of the things that I'm constantly pushing my patients to do is notice what that emotion feels like in their body. Because sometimes that's a huge cue, like noticing sort of their heart beating or noticing that tension, noticing sort of that pit in their stomach or the heaviness of dread. And this can often really help a person become more aware of their emotions. Um, I feel like a lot of my patients experience almost like hyper arousal, like their central nervous system is they're starting at like a five when they wake up, but most of us are probably starting at a two or a three and how that's affecting also think about when we're doing exposures is that if a person's already starting at baseline at a five, you really want to think about like, how are you pushing them and where are you starting off in the hierarchy and how that might look different. And then the last thing is, so we can think about ourselves as a dimmer switch on a light where we can turn that light really, really bright and we can also dim it down. And there's all these different gradations. You can think about that emotions are actually experienced maybe like just a light switch on off. Or I had a patient once when I said the on off said, actually, Dr. Sachs, it's more like a three-way light bulb. It's off, on, or really on. And it's really hard for them to notice sort of those gradations. So one of the things that we can do with mindfulness and other techniques is we can start to teach a person a little bit more about that gradations um, and um, or just recognizing that that's going to be their experience. And then those sensory motor differences. Um, the only other thing that I like to add that's not in the DSM is this idea of adaptive skills. So adaptive skills are our day-to-day -day living skills, which I like to explain to my patients and their family. If mom and dad got hit by lightning, could I survive? skills. Um, can I wake myself up in the morning? Can I get myself dressed? Can I take my medication? Can I get to where I need to go with transportation? Can I functionally use money? Those kinds of stuff. And so what we know is for people on this spectrum, typically they are, their adaptive skills are below what we would expect for their age and IQ. And so that's going to be one of the things that we may want to teach and target in therapy. And the reason why I bring it up is it also may impact our OCD work. So if we know a person has contamination, OCD, and um, they are washing, 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 and spending hours in the shower. Or we notice that they're sort of ritualistically doing laundry in an odd way. Well, part of it may be is they don't know how to do laundry. Or I had a patient once who actually just didn't know how to rinse out shampoo out of their hair. So in that example, they were being treated like it was a compulsion and they were compulsively washing, when in fact, it was just actually a skill that needed to be taught of how do we get sh shampoo effectively out of our hair. And so um, there's the Vineland and the ABAS are really, really nice tools that you can use with your patients or with families to sort of get at that, to start to like have a little bit more insight into if that's an area of target and how things are affecting it. Um, so yeah, the I think the 14th slide is just a really nice visual from Living Well on the Spectrum, which sort of walks through the over-responsiveness, feeling overwhelmed, or the under-responsiveness, sort of seeking out sensory information in all these different ways. Um, and I like it just to sort of give a... Um, a point of reference for people who maybe aren't as familiar about that. Um, medically, just some other things to take note of is often there are GI issues that are present in um, individuals on the spectrum. So either constipation or a lot of GI distress. And so unknown is, is, is this uh, something more biological going on? Is this, again, more because of stress and sort of their relationship to stress? Is this also maybe more of like a hypersensitivity to pain and discomfort, um, not just emotionally, but also internally, um, like sort of proprioceptically? So just something to be aware of. I would also say um, maybe need some explicit instruction on hygiene, puberty, and sex. Um, and yeah, because again, if we think about how do most of us learn about sex, well, locker room talk or sleepover talk, um, which sounds funny, but that's really the truth of developmentally how we learn about it. And if we know that people have social communication difficulties and maybe their same age peer relationships are impacted in some way, this may be um, an area where they're lacking information 
And you may be the person who can provide that information to them. And again, if we're more thinking about on that OCD realm of person who maybe has taboo OCD thoughts, um, we're also going to want to make sure, like, does this person know how to, yeah, I'm going to say it on the webinar for perpetuity. Do they know how to masturbate properly? Like, or maybe that lack of that knowledge is it's affecting them and it's creating a cycle with OCD. I would also say sleep issues are prominent. I think, sir, I, you know what, so this is my plea to anyone out there. If there is someone out there who is a sleep researcher or a sleep clinic, can we please start collecting some really good data on people on the spectrum? Because as far as I know, it's not really out there and we need this more because what we know is mood disorders and mood conditions are really sleep disorders and sleep conditions. And so when we're knowing that there's something going on with circadian rhythms with these folks, we also know that it's impacting mood and functionality, which we could see depression or bipolarity being affected. But we also know that if we're seeing mood being affected, that's just going to also affect our anxiety and OCD. So that's my plea. I would love it if somebody took me up on that. All right. So now... Let's go to OCD. I'm assuming most people here know a lot about OCD, so I'm not going to spend that much time on it. But along with sort of that change um, with DSM-5, OCD was put in its own category. It was also um, grouped together with BDD, um, skin picking and hair pulling, and hoarding. And just also this idea of it's not just about anxiety with OCD, that sometimes it's just a discomfort comfort and not the right feeling, or also even disgust is sort of the primary emotion. And that might be some of the, without getting too much more into the rationales of why we're seeing it moved into its own category. So everyone here knows obsessions are intrusive, unwanted thoughts, images, or urges. What I really like to do is just call them uncomfortable inner experiences um, by sort of putting it all in that category. Um, inner experiences that make us feel uncomfortable and nobody likes to feel discomfort. I don't know about you guys, I can't remember the last time I woke up and said, I can't wait to feel uncomfortable today, right? So what do we do? We traditionally try to do something to turn off our discomfort and that's where we see these compulsions or rituals or behaviors um, that we're seeing over here with OCD. So let's put OCD and autism side by side. So what we know is that both people will have sort of recurrent thoughts, but for people with OCD, these recurrent thoughts are often intrusive and unwanted, whereas for people with autism, these thoughts aren't necessarily unwanted, that it's more an inflexible adherence to sameness versus that there's sort of this repetitive intrusiveness into their um, day. What I would also say is we can think about the repetitive behaviors in OCD. An individual feels like compelled or driven to do, again, to create some kind of relief or alleviation of that discomfort. For people with autism, you can think about it more, it's like a fixation that's almost egosyntonic, that it's not to give them relief, but it's, if anything, to give them pleasure of this fixation that they could be having. Um, we also know thematically that I would say is when we're talking about contamination, harm, violence, and taboo thoughts, when there's checking, counting, asking for reassurance, and also that not so right feeling, when this inner experiences, we can say categorically are falling more into that, that's when I say we're in OCD land. And then when I would say when they're not falling in those categories, that's where we're more likely to see there's this stuck or fixated element that's really more autism um, and sort of this repetition. Um, so not everybody, because we know that often one of our modifiers for OCD is the level of insight. Um, but I would say a majority of people who are coming to our office at the very least have some kind of insight that their um, thoughts and rituals are not something that they want to continue, that um, they want to stop the thought from occurring, it feels uncomfortable, it seems illogical, and that the rituals in some way are impacting them. And I would say is when you're trying to think about 
is this behavior more um, ASD, what I would say is they're not necessarily bothered by the thoughts. They're not really finding for themselves that their repetitive behaviors are functionally having impact. So the school or their parents or other or their spouses may find that some of this repetition and fixation and perseveration is functionally impacting them, but not always individuals on the spectrum. Um, and that's another way to sort of tease these things out. Sometimes also these fixations and interests can actually be a strength um, for individuals on the spectrum. And I just like to point that out too, is where we typically don't think of those obsessions as leading to any type of like occupational or academic strength or benefit to people. Um, so symptom and course, I already talked about sort of autism being this lifelong condition. Well, there are some people who say that they can't remember a time when they didn't have OCD. Traditionally, we see sort of OCD show up um, at different points in people's lives. So usually like the end of primary school, sometime when they're teenagers or going off to college, um, also early 30s um, after pregnancy. Um, so it's sort of when we're seeing these brain and social demand changes um, and that's another thing that I could say is often looking at like sort of when does OCD show up and what's its course versus ASD other things that I think most of you guys are doing you're asking about family history so that often gives us and one of the things that I like to do with autism is say, even if a person didn't have a diagnosis like is there an Uncle Bobby that maybe seems a little similar to your son um, to sort of get at that question I would also say atypical response to medication. So do we see paradoxical effects with medication? Do we see it working and then plateauing? So a lot of times we're seeing that in autistic individuals, um, which also then will impact, are we just doing straight CBT with ERP? Are we thinking about a psychiatric referral and including an SRI um, in that? And what does that mean? And so like, you know, I feel very, very appreciative that here in New York City, we have some phenomenal psychiatrists who really, really understand OCD and even understand OCD with autism. I don't know if necessarily the landscape out of New York City, I'm sure there are other pockets, but that psychiatrists are as savvy, right? And so part of me is if I had an individual who had both OCD and autism, and I know that there may be these atypical or paradoxical responses, this is something that I very much want to keep in mind when I'm talking to the psychiatrist that's treating that individual. Um, great. All right. So just what do we do now? So I like to go whether it's autism or whether it's OCD, if there's a behavior that I know that's negatively impacting um, the individual I'm working with, I like to go to my old school behaviorism and say WTF. What's the function of the behavior, right? Is there a sensory function? Is there an escape function? Is there an attention function? Are they getting some kind of tangible? Or maybe there's a medical rule out that I also need to do and there's a medical um, function. And maybe it's a combination. So for most of us who are doing um, exposure and response prevention, we're usually targeting the function of escape. Um, now, what we may find is that people are inadvertently getting some kind of attention or a tangible along with it and we wanna change that. Um, but also what we know is for our more autistic behaviors is sometimes it may also be attention and tangible or sensory. And that's an important thing that I like to do. So I'm gonna skip over this next slide um, saying that all behaviors are functional, but go to the motivational assessment scale. I like it sometimes when I'm working with parents in schools and they're saying, oh my God, this kid is getting up and down and up and down and up and down all day, like zipping and unzipping his backpack and things like that. And this is where I like to ask the teachers to fill out the mask because often this is a nice tool that can help us get to sort of the functionality of the behavior in a way that also makes it easy. I'm not gonna go over this chart. It's just a really nice chart, and I think I include at the second one where I got this chart from, about often atypical responses to medication that you'll find for a person on the spectrum. I did, good for me. Um, I guess I'm doing self-talk out loud. All right, so let's talk about what our CBT treatments are when an individual is both on the spectrum and also um, 
I'll probably do that for 10 minutes and then we'll have 10 minutes for questions or people can stick around. So at the end of the day, conceptually treatment is the same. We just need to do some ASD friendly modifications. So one of the things is if we know people are dichotomous thinkers, they're literal with language, it's really, really hard for them to think abstractly. We want to make sure we're speaking and presenting information as concretely as possible. We also know if that change and transition is tough and that um, planning and prioritizing are difficulty. Um, one of the things I really like to do is write out a session agenda so people know how are we going to spend the next 45 or 90 minutes. Um, I like to build in a lot of reinforcement and breaks because, again, is knowing about sort of how maybe these four wheels of their car are working differently. There is just sort of general frustration about participating in any new or challenging activity for 45 minutes. So making sure I'm reinforcing a person. I'm also knowing about this emotional regulation challenges, making sure, again, that I'm building in these reinforcement and breaks. Um, so whereas rationale may seem a lot more obvious for our e, um, neurotypical patients is we're really going to want to connect the dots a lot more for some of our patients. Now, the only thing is that I would say is a lot of times you get, especially with patients who are going to have a higher IQ with you and that are very, very verbal and that are almost like these mini philosophers, they're going to hammer and hammer and hammer and hammer and push about what's the rationale. And so these are the people that I say, actually, you know what the rationale is? The rationale is to be more flexible. The rationale is to lean into discomfort and do things even when you don't understand them, right? And it's really the truth when we're thinking about it is this whole idea of uncertainty that we're constantly targeting. And um, with our neurotypical OCD patients, we're just gonna, that's sort of our thing. You know what? The rationale is a little uncertain, but do you trust me? Like, can we take this leap or can we try it just today at the very least? Um, very concrete goals. These are people who I would say are going through life constantly knowing that they're intelligent and capable and often feeling like it's not working. Right. And so what we want to do at the very least is create concrete and achievable goals. So they feel like therapy is working in some way. I would also say pacing. You know, I think just the pacing is going to go a lot slower when we're seeing it as a co-occurring condition. A nice rule of thumb that I like to say is for every week of ERP that you're doing with a neurotypical person, I think at least a month of ERP um, with a person on the spectrum. So again, if now who really ever does six to 12 weeks of ERP? None of us really do, I think. But if you're thinking that's a typical trajectory, all right, Elliot's saying he does, so good for Elliot. Uh, <laughs> um, this is gonna look more like a half a year to a year with a patient. And I think sort of managing the patient's expectations, managing your own expectations, especially if you're not working with a full caseload of autistic patients. Um, I often, so part of my practice is OCD only, I say, and I'll bang out those 45 minutes. Like I'm like, whoa, that's the quickest 40 and easiest 45 minutes I've done. And it's just, it's all about sort of pacing and like having to do these other modifications uh, and a greater behavioral focus. I would say less about if you're doing sort of a cognitive work, I would say focus a lot more. And this other idea that generalization is really poor, we're just going to have to do a lot of repetition in a lot of settings, which also affects pacing. So again, we're going to want to pull the family in because homework is going to be really, really important and think about how can we get that generalization. So not everybody, but a lot of people on the spectrum are more visual processors. So rather than just sort of this lecture and talking, which is why I wanted to make sure you guys had the slides to look at, we're going to want to have some visual cues for an individual. Um, that's why I like writing out my agenda. That's also why um, if you are using SUDS or even want to communicate, maybe having a visual of a five-point scale, maybe also having a visual of those emotions. If we're going to be saying we're doing more ritual delay versus response prevention, especially at the beginning, have a very visual timer. Um, 
So I don't think you need to jump to incorporating a preferred interest because again, we're targeting flexibility, but sometimes at the beginning of therapy for a person who's really not motivated for a younger child, incorporating a preferred interest might really make sense, whether it be like superheroes or, you know, something else, making sure can we share these concepts in that way. Definitely, I would say addressing caregiver accommodation. Um, I think what we see is because of executive functioning challenges, either um, young adults are staying at home a lot longer or they find a spouse or some other way where somebody is often acting as their executive functioning. But when a person also has OCD, that means that probably that person is inadvertently really being brought into that accommodation role and we really want to work on it. Um, contingency management. So we were just talking about a professor at Hofstra um, who's no longer with us, but Richard O'Brien. And one of the best pieces of advice that Richard O'Brien said is if therapy is not working, it's just you haven't found the right reinforcer. Like you have to go back to your RF and it's wrong. And so you got to figure it out. And so a lot of these things that we often think about social motivation, making people proud of us because, you know, we're getting better, um, might not necessarily be there. So sometimes incorporating more tangibles in or really figuring out what's reinforcing. Um, why is treatment hard? Um, change is challenging for all of us, but especially for this group. Um, for with this dichotomous thinking, sometimes we find they're either all in therapy or they're out. It's not like, a, oh, okay, I'm still going along with it and giving my go. So we really sort of want to try to address that. Um, what I would say is this urge for feeling comfortable is so strong. And one of the things is um, so much of life is so, so uncomfortable, right? So we want to definitely push that sort of leaning into discomfort and like looping it back to values and to the rationale. But also this may look a little different is looking at other areas of their life where we are not going to work on distress tolerance and we are going to work on how do we make life feel a little bit more comfortable. That maybe a person with a sensory sensitivity and we're doing an exposure, I am going to accommodate that sensory sensitivity or I'm not going to like, in most of my patients I don't assist, especially when I'm doing exposures for them to give me any type of eye contact. And boy, I must have the most interesting bookshelf because like all throughout exposure, they're just looking at my bookshelf. Not everyone. But and so we're going to think about it that way um, where it might look a little different. Um, so again, is let's use exposure and response prevention because we know it has a great evidence base. And we also know that it does have an evidence base for individuals, um, for autistic individuals. More of the research is on children. But again, um, why would we think it would just work on children and not adults with the co-occurring conditions? Um, I find that my autistic patients, um, this idea of SUDS is very, very difficult for them. Like, it, they're sort of meaningless. Sometimes I say, like, low, medium, high, how are you feeling? But what I've also noticed is that habituation can take a really long time, if anything, like hours, that it's often very rare we're going to experience habituation in sessions. So the really nice thing is what we know, we've been following up on the literature, is habituation is not necessary for us to do successful treatment, which is so if we're following more an inhibitory learning model is just really leaning on that. And I would really, really encourage in this population, if that's not what you're doing, is sort of learning more about that from the literature, um, which um, talks about distress tolerance and disconfirming expectations and how we're going to do ERP cross situationally and also not necessarily banging through a hierarchy from low to high, but maybe jumping around the hierarchy in different ways. Um, yeah. So this is just an example of the five point scale for you guys to see um, and talking about breaks. The other thing is um, teaching different ways to show emotion. Another example for sort of this emotion scrapbook. Um, so one of the things that I also like to do is multiple choice questions. If I have to pull anything out of slide 38 for theory of mind, we say like, usually don't ask yes, no questions, but I find open-ended questions are just a bit too abstract. So like, were you thinking this? 
this or something else. Usually my choice C is or something else. Um, but I find multiple choice really sort of opens up the conversation and communication. Also, sometimes with communication, knowing that it's difficult, I'll just hand over a whiteboard if I notice it. I said, why don't you write it down or draw a picture of what you're thinking? And sometimes taking out that sort of verbal element and then still being able to communicate in without having to do it that way, like really opens up um, the floodgates in a really positive way. Um, what I would also think trust is really important with this population. We talk a lot about rapport. These are people who go beyond rapport. I would say honesty and authenticity are probably values um, and a strength of a lot of our autistic patients. So we're going to want to bring honesty and authenticity to build that kind of trust with our patients. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, when people are asking me, what do you do for a living? I say, I get paid to torture people. And that is what we're doing here. And so it requires like a really high level of trust. Like, hey, I'm gonna give you money and time to make me feel terrible. Um, and I don't really understand it and it's all uncertain. So yeah, we want to make sure we're building in trust. And I think that's really, really important with this population. Um, yeah, um, I think this is a really good time to stop for questions. So bang them out, Elliot. All right. <laughs> Start with this one. Go to the name. Okay. I'm wondering if it's possible for those with both autism and OCD to have OCD thoughts and ruminations that also act as autistic stims. It seems like my son with both almost like enjoys is the wrong word, but somehow gets some satisfaction from the OCD ruminating. I think he thinks he can think his way out of ruminating. Also, is it generally harder for people with autism to recognize their OCD? Um, I don't know if it's necessarily harder, I'll answer the second question first, for people with autism to recognize their OCD. What I would say is, that again, because so much of the world feels uncomfortable and because they're often thinking about the world in very black and white terms, what you can often see is that there is a high frequency of behavior that is being driven by an escape paradigm. So if you're sort of approaching almost all of life, not just OCD, but in general, a lot of areas of your life um, through an escape or avoidance paradigm, it's going to be sort of hard to like notice that there's this other beast going on. It doesn't feel as different. Um, so for the first question, um, what I would say is, yeah, there are sometimes come, and this is where I would say there's sometimes like a functional analysis of what's going on. Um, because I would even say people without autism is ruminations really, really tough. Rumination often seems enjoyable. It creates this illusion that we're doing something productive. So it's serving both sort of like an escape function about my worry and distress about something that's happening either to me right now or in the future, but it also gives us something. It's not like a clear tangible, but it's giving us this illusion of productivity or something like that. Um, and so that's where I think we, if we're thinking about it in that way um, to whatever is going on with this example, that there can sort of be these dual processes. And this is where um, I would say we can rely on both sort of hanging out with that inner experience, whether it be a little enjoyable or whether it be uncomfortable, a little mixed and starting to get very meta about it. I'm having this inner experience, and wait a minute, that inner experience isn't necessarily the truth. It's just a thought. It's just an inner experience. And I can observe that I'm having this inner experience. So very mindfully, but this is a way and a skill if we're finding there's a lot of sort of time suck and rigidity or repetitiveness that's getting in the way of maybe them integrating at school or with peers or doing their homework or being with the family, that if we can teach this individual, hey, look, sometimes we're gonna have these thoughts, we're gonna feel like they need to capture our attention, whether enjoyable 
where they're uncomfortable and we can start to just observe that we're having these thoughts and not necessarily give them the attention and sort of focus on something else in life. Now, that sounds pretty complex. Um, so we would want to maybe start small. So we're just going to do this for five minutes a day. We're just going to do this at dinner time. Um, and probably, again, build in a lot, a lot of rewards for practicing that skill. Um, I hope I answered that question. And, uh, here with the Twitter question. Okay. Yeah, no, suicidal self-injury. Ah, got it. Is CBT a hard sell for ASD with non-suicidal injury, considering the motivation for change may not be present in the same way? Um, so one of the things that we might find out with non-suicidal injury, like head banging or fist pounding, um, one of the things is, so I actually have a patient who, when I first met him, um, would, as soon as you talked about a topic that was um, either a little shame provoking, I would say, or a little difficult, and especially because of his communication, you'd start to see him engage in those behaviors. Um, and so part of it was, I think, one of the things that I did was really start to do theory of mind and explain like, hey, when I see you do these behaviors, I feel really confused and concerned because I'm not sure what's going on and I'm also really afraid you're gonna hurt yourself. So I'd like you to understand how concerned I am when you're doing that and see if we can um, target that, would that be okay? Um, and, and you know, this is where I'm really leading with my emotion and often my emotions are concern, curiosity and confusion in these areas. I find like those are the three words I use a lot of to gain a lot of clarity on these things. It's a fact feeling prayer request. When I see you doing this, I feel confused, um, concerned or curious because, and I'll sort of elaborate. So I'd like, and often the thing I'm just asking for them is to understand. And that often will open this up. So when I see you banging this way, I feel really concerned and confused. Can we target this? And so I think him just understanding how this felt so scary to the people around him um, and how we desperately wanted to help and connect and didn't know how to in those moments gave an entreeway to start to change. And then what we really did is realize that in those moments, there was this both emotional dysregulation and communication breakdown. And so starting to really figure out more um, different emotional regulation strategies, also being able to draw a lot of pictures when like there were strong feelings that he felt like he couldn't get out this way. So being able to write it down, sometimes it's even like having index cards with very like typical thoughts and very typical emotions and just even saying like, hey, are you feeling any of these things? Um, and through time, like it's really drastically changed, I would say in two years that I don't see any of those behaviors anymore. Um, I think part of the motivation, even though social motivation might not be exactly the same, is focusing on this one-on-one -on -one relationship and sort of demystifying um, why it feels uncomfortable for other people with that. Um, can I see the question? I feel like there's a little bit more to that question. Okay, I answered it. All right, thanks. Next question. Um, what advice would you give to a parent who has a kid um, on the spectrum and is just, you know, just learning about it and like what steps to start getting help? Ah, okay. So one thing, one piece of advice I would say is start to do your own process of understanding your kid's not broken, your kid's not defective, your kid just thinks differently. And that your kid is phenomenally awesome in the ways that he or she thinks differently. But it's a real big shift for parents. If, you know, look, we say parenting doesn't come with a manual or a rule book, but you, it often comes in the back of our mind with a neurotypical rule book. Because if we're neurotypicals, at the very least, we sort of know ourselves. And if we're saying like, well, I don't have this parenting rule book, and then I really don't have this neurodiverse one. 
So one is really, and so one of these things is start to meet actually autistic adults who can demystify that neurodiverse rule book. And I think that'll really help you become a better parent. Um, you know, there's an amazing actually autistic you know, Twitter out there world. There's some really great Facebook groups. You can even um, go to conferences, make friends. You know, some of my friends are autistic people and they're awesome. And I bet you, you know, adults can do that as well. Um, talk to other parents, like go to your SEPTA, your special education PTA, um, and start to just really learn a lot more. There are also some really phenomenal books out there. Um, so I would say like do a deep dive and educate how your kid's brain works differently. And start to then understand like one good book that's out there is by Jed Baker, No More Meltdowns. And it's really, um, looking at what are antecedents to behaviors and what are consequences or reinforcement to behaviors, which everything like we do, but in a very parent friendly way of starting to understand if we want to support our kid, like what are some things we may need to modify um, that will either increase or decrease the behavior that we want or don't want. And what are some things that we could do that will follow that again, will increase or decrease that behavior. Um, so learning, I think also about behaviorism. Yeah. Okay. And then it was also asked, um, people who are interested in treating individuals on the spectrum, what kind of training opportunities are there? What kind of training is necessary? So I don't know if there's anything the training that's necessary. I think if you're a good CBT therapist, you're probably better at this than you think. Um, so I would say is, you know, one of the nice things is the IOCDF, I feel like has been committed to trying to create more opportunities. Just this past year, they had a pre-con, like a half day training on this. If you want that, I would say reach out to them, write to Jeff Zemanski and like let them know. Oh, I'm so bummed I missed that. Um, you can definitely reach out to me. Um, I am hopefully going to start a peer group. I also know at like conferences, even like ADAA, and I think even at ABCT, there are going to be some really informative things. I, so, and I would also really encourage people to buy Val Gauss's book because it really is written for CBT practitioners and really helps break things down. Um, there's also a really nice book that's more about CBT for like children that I think is by White. Um, I'm going to botch up the author, so I'm not going to say it. I think White is one of the authors. Um, so, yeah. What I would just say is start talking with colleagues. Like once you start to understand the core deficits, you just um, are playing around with ERP a little differently. And the best advice I could say for playing around with ERP is low and slow. Low and slow. That's it. Um, which we do with some of our other patients. It's just because of this illusion of competency because often they can be so verbal or um, so like, yeah, competent in other areas of their life that we, we forget to go low and slow with this group. Someone asked, um, they notice frequently uh, that individuals on the spectrum come in with very low uh, treatment motivation. So um, how do you best handle that? Any kind of thoughts and ideas? Um, so there might be a low treatment motivation for a lot of reasons. Part of it is they might be a being accommodated or reinforced a lot. Like I said, if I went to work and I got to play video games with my patients all day and their parents still paid me the money that they're paying me now, I don't know if I would do therapy. I might just play video games with my patients. Uh, one would hope not. One would hope I'm not doing that. But it's a possibility, right? And so one of the things that I even like to talk about, and this is where it's hard with some of our teens and young adults, because often they are living at home, and so they're sort of developmentally should be more independent, is really pulling in this question of what are rights and what are privileges. So the rights, what a child is sort of obligated to get from their parent is help, Care, education, I say up to the age of 18, shelter, appropriate clothing, food, and love. The state won't come in and take you away from your family if they're not providing love, but I throw love in there. And everything else is privileges. And so often what I see is the health obligation is being neglected and a person's getting a free pass. It's sort of like not doing therapy while they're getting all 
all of these privileges for not doing anything. So sometimes it's like having to really work with the family to change those contingencies. Now, um, that's also a quick way if on the second session, I turn to my uh, patient, I say, so I'm going to tell your parents to like take away your internet and take away your computer and take away your video games. You're going to come back to me next week, right? You love me. No, that's not going to happen. So often during the intake, I sort of know in my mind, the jig's going to be up at some point. But what I am going to try to do is maybe not dive into ERP, not be doing all that formal stuff. And again, really talking about that relationship, that trust that authenticity, um, really getting to know that person and have them get to know me. So when it is time for me to say, I give this, I actually give this talk, I show rights and privileges. And as I'm writing on the board, the patient themselves goes, oh, I know where a doctor's going with this. Mm -hmm. But they sort of get it at that point and they trust me at that point and understand at the very least I have their interests in there. Um, so that might be a month or two in. That's sort of one of the things that I would do. I would also say, again, um, if we wanted, to, I would, this is where I would lean in a little bit more to preferred interests. I would really like get involved. And this is where, you know, I think we're really good at metaphors in our, uh, in our profession and really trying to connect the metaphor of whatever their preferred interest is to this idea of ERP. And I think it's not so hard. Whatever a person's interest is, is somehow you can connect it to this idea of being able to do distress tolerance, being able to do uncertainty tolerance, being able to focus on process and not outcome. Um, we're just gonna have to try to find that hook with their preferred interest. Um, so that's another thing that I would say with people with low motivation. And then, yeah, and then like also really talking about values. I think these are people who um, do enjoy this discussion on a philosophical level um, of what their values are and figuring that out. But that's gonna take a lot of time before maybe we're even like doing our first steps of ERP is sort of laying that groundwork. Okay, um, last question okay. is uh, ERP with nonverbal. Um, individuals who are nonverbal? Yeah. Um, so obviously, you're going to need to include um, other people in on that. Um, and this is where I would say we're not going to want to do a pure distress tolerance model. This is where I think we're going to want to do more of a systematic desensitization and also maybe with some distractors going along with it. Um, we also still, I would say, is really more ritual delay. So I'm thinking of, um, and this is, wasn't for OCD, this was more a sensory sensitivity, but I was working with a, uh, um, fairly nonverbal. She was a little verbal, but really I would consider um, low verbal. Uh, I think she was six years old at the time I met her. And loud noises were so bothersome to her, um, her mom using a hair dryer, vacuuming, that she would engage in such escape behaviors that she would scratch, she would spit, she would start pulling down her pants because she knew like if she was in public, um, that would often get her out of the situation. And parents came to me because they were really scared because summer was approaching and they had um, their air conditioning unit they knew that whenever was gonna go on. So we did it. I mean, what we basically did was mom brought in her hair dryer and we would do like probably 30 seconds of the hand dryer on while singing if you're happy and you know it um as a distractor and she was crying a little bit through it like those 30 seconds were still really difficult we're probably doing if you're happy and you know it made it a little bit more palatable and then yeah making it very very obvious how we were reinforcing her with stickers with praise and then also her um getting to do something fun after therapy and so like we were maybe doing 30 seconds of erp the first week and she, so one of the things was providing a lot of psychoeducation also to the parents about all this. And like, lo and behold, summer came, air conditioning was on, the girl even started like playing with um, the hair dryer, parents could vacuum easily. Uh, so it, it is possible, again, low and slow. And I would say, yeah, um, that is where I would do much more of a hierarchy and graded with a little distraction and very, very immediate and concrete reinforcers. All right.
So nice that you did a good job. Thank you. And thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. I couldn't tell, but you've been a phenomenal audience. You haven't interrupted me once. All right. <laughs> <laughs>